Since June, we have known that uh, Pastor Micah and April and their family, our youth pastor, who had served here for uh, a couple of years, they uh, were transitioning in their ministry and they went to Cincinnati. And, and since that time, uh, we've, had our, our, uh, we've had our lay people leading our youth group. We are actively seeking our next youth pastor. So if you have any questions about that process, please come and ask me. But I've been in uh, conversations with one uh, uh, candidate individual in particular, and we are we are at work uh, trying to see if that is God's will for him and for us. So we're we're looking. Okay. And the second thing is this: I think we've told you a few different times. Uh, this building was built. 98, 99, 2000. Do you, does anybody remember exactly? 2001. This building, this this property was was purchased uh, from from the days where this church was over on Memorial Drive. This property was purchased. This building was built in about 2001, and we are just in the next few weeks. We are going to pay this building off. <laughs> So I tell you that because of this. If, if you have a mortgage payment at your house and you pay your mortgage off, you celebrate, right? <laughs> you know, write the bank a letter, thanks for the calendars, but we're done. Uh, and then that changes your reality. And our Reality here in our church is about to change because, praise God, because of the faithfulness of God's church, uh, we're about to be debt-free, and that is amazing. Uh, that would be amazing for you and your family and your household. It's amazing for us here in our church family. And so we want to pray for wisdom. We want to pray for a generous spirit. We want to pray for what does God have for us next. So start praying about that. Pray for our church board and our leaders. Pray that we would uh, know what to do next because our picture, our financial picture is about to be very different in a good way. So we praise God for that. I started last week preaching from the book of Jonah. So if you want to look in the Old Testament, uh, halfway between the Psalms and the end of the Old Testament is the book of Jonah. It's only four chapters, so if you flip too quickly, you're going to miss it. But open up your Bibles to the book of Jonah. Jonah chapter 1, we looked at last Sunday, and it starts like this. The word of the Lord came to Jonah... And the Lord said, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it. Do you still have that picture, Jeff? Can you find that picture? The Lord said to Jonah, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. And last week we looked at God's call, God's call to Jonah the prophet. Jonah lived in Galilee about where Jesus uh, was, uh, was born and was raised. And God called him about 500 miles away to go to Nineveh, which was the capital city of the Assyrians. And the Assyrians were overwhelmingly powerful. They were a brutal uh, military nation. They would... They would uh, uh, show their dominance. They wouldn't just come and defeat you in battle. They would crush you. And uh, they were a horrible foreign power. God said to his prophet, I want you to go there and I want you to preach to them. Instead of going about 500 miles northeast, Jonah said, I'm out of here. He goes southwest. He gets on a boat to head 2,500 miles in the opposite direction. Now, in, in verse 2, I, I usually preach, and I'm going to go Bible nerd for just a second. So if you're not a Bible nerd, phase me out for about 30 seconds. But, uh, but I usually preach out of the New International Version. It's not a perfect version of the Bible, but it's a pretty good version of the Bible. It's very easy to read and to hear. Uh, but I don't like how verse 2 is translated. It just says, go to the great city of Nineveh. Other, other versions of the Bible, it's got a different picture there. God says to Jonah, arise. Hang, on, hang in there with me. Bible nerd, remember? 
Arise, go up to that great city of Nineveh. So different versions, the New Living Translation, the, the, uh, uh, some, some others, give it a different picture. He does, God doesn't just say, hey, go to that city. He says to Jonah, arise and go up to that great city of Nineveh. And the reason I say that is because Jonah spends the rest of chapter 1... God called him to go up to that great city. Jonah spends the rest of chapter 1 going down. Think about it. In, in chapter 1, what we looked at last week, Jonah went down to Joppa. He went down underneath the deck on the boat. He went down into sleep. He went down into the water. And he went down into the fish. What did God call him to do? Arise, get up, and go up to that city. Jonah instead, he doesn't just run the opposite direction. He doesn't just run five times the, uh, as far as God wanted him to go the first time. But he goes down and down and down and down. And so we finished last week at the end of chapter 1. If you remember, God, God gives Jonah the call. God is sending Jonah to Nineveh to preach. He decides to flee. He ignores God. We're good at that sometimes. But God doesn't give up on Jonah. God doesn't give up on Jonah's mission. God sends the storm. The sailors do their best, but eventually they throw Jonah overboard and attempt to save their own lives. That should have been Jonah's end, but God is actively at work saving him. Even in the midst of all this trouble, God calls him to arise. He goes down, down, down. And at the end of chapter 1, it says this, Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Chapter 2. If you would like to this morning, you can stand with me in honor of God's word. Let me read chapter 2 to you. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths. Hear these, hear these images again of going down, down into the deep, down into the depths. Listen to some of these words. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I've been banished from your sight. Yet, I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me, and the deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. Ew. To the root of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayers rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. A wonderful use of the word vomit. Thus saith the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You can be seated. So my inner middle schooler just had a field day just saying the word vomit with a microphone. That was awesome. Okay. So I want, I want, to, I want, to, I want you to have this picture that God says to Jonah, Arise, get up, go up to that great city of Nineveh. Instead, Jonah spends the next hours, days, weeks going down. He goes the opposite direction. He goes down to Joppa. He gets onto a ship. He goes down below decks. He goes down into sleep. The, the sailors do their very best to save the ship, but they know that the gods are against them. 
and that someone has to pay for this. And Jonah says, just throw me overboard. And they fight him, but they eventually they throw him. He goes down into the sea. God sends a fish, swallow him up. He goes down into the belly of the fish. And in chapter 2, he calls out to the Lord. The belly of the fish, that's what I want to talk about this morning. The belly of the fish represents our lowest points, our lowest times, our lowest moments. Think about what that is in your life. It's just going to be different like a, like a fingerprint with every single one of us in here. It's going to be different. What are the lowest points in your life? It seemed like God was punishing. When we, when we saw last week, God is at work saving Jonah. Still, Psalm 139, we looked at last week. Where can I go from your presence? Can I go up to the top of a mountain and be out of your presence? No. Can I go down into the depths of the sea and be away from your presence? No. Could I even be in the gut of a big fish and be away from your presence? No. But the belly of the fish represents our lowest moments, our lowest times, our greatest pain. Sometimes we're tempted to think that the pain we're going through is because God hates us. God is mad at us. God is punishing us. Dane and I were in an amusement park one day. It was a special event. And part of the event, you, you had to pay a little bit extra, but part of the event was you had unlimited ice cream. So not only were you in this place and you could ride roller coasters all the time, but you get off the roller coaster and as you're going around, this is, this is me running around, okay? As you're running around to get back in the front of the line, you grabbed another ice cream sandwich. And I would grab an ice cream sandwich, and while I'm waiting in line to ride the roller coaster again, I'd, I'd need another ice cream sandwich. And I'd get off, and I'd come around. That same dude was there, and I'd go, hey, Hal, how you doing? He'd go, hi, Rich, good to see you. You going to ride again? Yeah, I'm going to ride again. He'd give me an ice cream sandwich, and I'd go, and we'd ride, and we'd spin, and then we'd get off, and I'd come, Hal, it's good to see you. And I'd take an ice cream sandwich, and we did that three, four, five, six times. And then it hit me. I'm not a young man anymore. <laughs> and there are choices and consequences. Sometimes the pain we feel is self-inflicted. Sometimes while I'm spinning around on said roller coaster, woo, going crazy, I could feel the churning in my belly and think, why does God do this to me? Come on, let's be honest. Sometimes the pain in our life is self-inflicted. Sometimes God is doing something in our lives and the pain we feel is for our good. It's to teach us. It's sometimes to correct us. We sometimes just kind of think of God as being an angry God or a punitive God, that he is punishing us or that he is angered with us. Sometimes the pain we feel is because we have done that to ourselves. Sometimes we get caught up in other people's trauma. Chuck does something and he takes me along with him. How many of you are fast drivers? I mean, like when you were a kid, you were crazy time, fast, 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 fast. Okay? I had a friend in high school who had, I mean, it was, it was, it was a really cool car. I know nothing about cars, but it was like a, it was like a, it wasn't like a, I think it was a charger. Did they make chargers back in the 70s? Yes. Okay, it was a souped up charger, and we lived out in the middle of the cornfields of southern Illinois, and if you've ever been in the cornfields of Illinois, about every mile there's a crossroads. And his goal was to see how fast you can go from one crossroads to the next crossroads. 
And he was overjoyed with getting up to over 100 miles an hour. Not so much. That does not excite me. It certainly didn't, didn't excite me when we were at 100 miles an hour between crossroad and crossroad, and he was not slowing down. And the corn was high. You could not see approaching traffic. There's just a four-way stop. And my very good friend, maniac, did not slow down. He just smoked through the intersection. I did not get back in the car with him. His decisions could have had a direct effect on me. Was that because of my bad decisions? Well, I got in the car with him. Bad decision number one. But I wasn't in control. Sometimes we have pain. Sometimes we go through struggles because of our own decisions. That's what happens here with Jonah. God said, arise, go up to Nineveh and preach. Instead, he goes down and down and down. But when you're in that pain, it's time to stop and ask a few questions. I forget where I came across this. This, this isn't unique to me. I don't know where I came across this, but I wrote this down, and I don't know that I've ever shared it with you before, but there are one, two, three, four. There are five words here that I want to give you quickly. Don't get lost in your pain. God can use those seasons of pain in your life. Sometimes we get defensive. Sometimes we get angry. God is angry with me. God is punishing me. Sometimes we learn lessons that we can only learn in the belly of the fish. Pain forces you to look. They're all L words, which preachers love to, like, you know, have a bunch of words that all this start the same letter. Pain forces you to look for Jesus, for help, for comfort, to the living word, to the written word. Pain causes us to look for Jesus. Pain forces you to listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit. There are times that you will listen only in the belly of the fish. Pain forces you to lean on his, what Deuteronomy calls, everlasting arms. Pain forces you to lean on his trustworthy, capable strength. Pain forces you, sometimes... To learn. If I ever go back to that amusement park, and if there's ever free unlimited ice cream, perhaps just two or three ice creams would be a good idea. Because something's got to break. Either the ice cream intake has to go down, or the roller coaster uh, riding has to go down, and Dana's not down with that. Pain forces you to learn where you went astray. Do you know what happened to Jonah in the fish? He probably had an aha come to Jesus moment where he had time to stroke his beard and say, Huh, I wonder how I got here. Pain forces us to look for Jesus, to listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit, to lean on him and his strength, to learn, and pain forces us to long for his presence, for his return, and for his kingdom. We live, shocker, we live in a broken, troubled world. Do you know what's great about that? It won't always be like this. There will come a day where he will reign and he will make all things new. There can be a purpose in our pain. Don't get lost in your pain. Another pastor, R.T. Kendall, wrote this. The belly of the fish is not a happy place, but it's a good place to learn. The Apostle Paul would have said it like this, Romans 8, 28. We know that in all things, God 
works for the good of those who love him. Am I in pain today? Is the pain of my own doing? Have I orchestrated my own troubles? Is God just done with me then? No. In all things, God is at work. Salvation is coming. Even here in Jonah chapter 2, we read Jonah's words in verse 6. He says, to the roots of the mountain, I sink down. Again, the down imagery. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord, brought my life up. People have hope today. Have hope today. That great theologian, Rodney Atkins, in 2006, wrote these words. If you're going through hell, keep on going. If you're a country music fan, you can see the video in your head right now. If you're going through hell today, if life around you has fallen if life around you has brought you to a place of pain, if you are in the belly of the fish, you can decide to just set up camp and live there. You can decide this is the way it is. I'm never going to get out of here. You can, you can just set up camp and just live there in the destruction, in the pain, in the mire, in the fish belly bile and whatever. You can stay there, but if you're going through hell, keep on going. The belly of the fish doesn't last forever. There's freedom coming. Now, full disclosure, freedom is coming through vomit. I, my inner middle schooler loves this passage. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Five minutes ago, he's in the fish. He's in the guts. He's, he's down. He's experiencing trouble. And he has time to look for God, to listen for his voice, to, to learn something. And God is with him even there. Freedom is coming. But there's still pain out there in front of us often. And God brings him to a point where he is about to be free. It still is unpleasant. It still is painful. But God is bringing him to freedom. Jonah didn't have to fix his mess before God would hear him or help him. And neither do we. In verse 6, in chapter 2, verse 6, But you, Lord my God, you brought my life up. Jonah didn't have to climb himself out of his own trouble. You don't have to climb yourself out of your own trouble. God lifts us. Now, it might be a long process. It might be a difficult process. You might go through an extended period in the belly of the fish. But I don't want you to think that that's the end. That's not the end of Jonah's story, and it's not the end of our story. God is bringing us out. And he did, he's done that with me. If we went around this morning, we could, all, we could give testimony that God has done that in our lives through our greatest troubles when we never would have known a way out. God can bring us through. We don't have to figure out our own way out. It's not up to you. If it was up to you, you're in trouble because what was up to you got you into the trouble to begin with, right? We don't just instantly get smarter in the belly of the fish. But sometimes we're humbled enough to look up and say, God, I can't do this. Would you help me? What is God doing in this season in your life? 
if this is you this morning, it might not be you. You might just need to take some notes and remember this one of these days when you're in the belly of the fish. But what is God doing in your life right now? What is God trying to get you to see, get you to hear? What is the purpose that God wants to achieve in your life. Paul says to the Romans, in all things God works. God's not just doing everything. If I have a car accident this afternoon and I can't walk anymore, God didn't do that to me. But even in that moment, God is at work doing something in my life, doing something around me, to do something for me, in my family, through my new circumstances. God is at work. He is actively at work seeking and saving his people. You don't have to figure out the way out. God can lift us out. But we need to call out to him. And in Jonah chapter 2, verse 1, it says, From the belly of the fish, he called out to the Lord his God. In my distress, I called to the Lord. And these next words, and he answered me. So last question. Does God love Jonah more than he loves you? If God heard a knucklehead like Jonah, and believe me, he's a knucklehead, come back for the next two weeks. If God loved a knucklehead like Jonah, he's not changed. He loves you. And if God can save a guy like Jonah, he can save you and me. And if God's not done with a rebel, and a runner like Jonah, he's not done with you. So we can call out to him. Would you stand up with me? We're going to pray here in just a moment. We're going to pray, we're going to sing a song, we're going to pray, we're going to close, and we're going to go. But as we close today, I want to ask you this question. If you are in the belly of the fish, do you want to stay there forever? <laughs> My, the guy who ordained me would, 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 uh, would say this. How's that working out for you? Rich, you've been running from God for a long time and you find yourself in trouble. You're in the belly of the fish. How's that working out for you? How long do you want to live here? Is this it? Or do you want God to do something different? If God said, arise, Jonah, and go up to that great city of Nineveh, and instead you went down to Joppa, down onto a boat, down below deck, down into sleep, down into the water, down to the belly of the fish, and then Jonah writes in chapter 2, he's got seaweed around his head. Blech. How's that working out for you? If you are in trouble today, if you are going through a time of pain, God can lift you up. And that begins when we say, God, it's the greatest prayer in the world, people. Write this down. God, help. You don't have to write it down. I think you can remember it. God, help. So you can pray this morning. Would you bow your heads with me? As we pray today, you can pray where you stand. You can sit. You're welcome to come and kneel at the altar. We're going to sing together in just a moment. But I want us to close in prayer, and I want us to be honest with our Heavenly Father, the one who doesn't leave us in the pit. He doesn't leave us where he found us. We can't go away from him. We can't. There is no away from him. He seeks us comes to us and wants to rescue. Pray with me this morning. God, there's somebody here today that is in trouble. There's somebody here today that feels like they're in the belly of the fish. It is a lousy place to just decide we're going to live. It's a great place to learn. It's a great place for us to see you, perhaps, more clearly. 
It's a great place for our ears to be opened that we might hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. So, God, where I might not hear you clearly when I'm on the mountaintop, there are times when I'm in the valley, when I'm in the valley of the fish going through pain, that I hear your call to me in a clearer way than I did before. God, if somebody hears your voice today, would you help us to respond? Would you help us to pray, Jesus, I've made a mess here. This news does not surprise you. But I'm in the belly of the fish. I'm in the pit. I'm in trouble. And I need you. Would you come in, Lord, and give me a fresh start? Would you come in and give me forgiveness? Would you come in and make things new? I don't like where I am. I want to know you, draw close to you, and follow you. God, would you help us to call out for your fresh grace today? And we'll pray that believing that you hear us and you're at work. You're rescuing and restoring right now. In your great name we pray, amen.